This is the last time that we get to do this, guys. <laughs> Feels kind of weird. Here we are. But um, this journey has been a real blessing. <laughs> As to all of us. <laughs> Let's pray. Jesus, you're so good. And you love each and every one of us. You've taught me how much that you love me. I have a lot of people that I love, but I would like them to know how much you love them. I pray that they may get to know you, Lord, starting with those that are in this room. I believe that you are real. Be with me today. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Self-preservation equals fear, and fear equals distrust in God. The reason we try to serve ourselves is because we're afraid of what might happen if we don't. We get into really bad situations, <laughs> um, and we wonder, who dug this hole that I'm in? <laughs> Is it me? And if, if it's not ourselves, we can blame someone else. If it's not them, we can keep going and going. But the, at the end of the day, we have to realize that there is an enemy. <laughs> and the things that get in our lives are not always our fault or the fault of those around us. But who works all things out for good. <laughs> God does. Self-preservation equals fear, and fear equals distrust in God. So whether we realize it or not, our human nature will lack the regard to realize how the consequences of our actions can affect other people. Uh, we all struggle with selfishness and it is God who is the very opposite of us who helps us come out of that. What selfishness does is it causes you to have tunnel vision, to think only about what you want because you may think that if I don't get this, I won't survive. If I don't make it through, <laughs> well, it's better me than someone else. Um, and you'll keep going with these things and you'll tell yourself that you're right. We all have very evil thoughts. <laughs> and we may think, well, they're just thoughts. But what we think ends up becoming our actions. And it's just like comfort doesn't equal safety. How do we change our, our thoughts? Well, unless by a miracle, it doesn't happen overnight. What does uh, go through our growth Jesus says that um, our growth is like that of a seed because he believes that progress is gradual. He knows that a tree takes time to grow and we take time to grow. We take time to grow into our full beauty. But like that tree, we are no less perfect at every stage of our growth. Jesus never expects us to change who we are, but he rather expects us to redirect who we are to do things for who he is. God doesn't want you to be someone that you're not. He doesn't want you to change your vocation. He just wants you to change your spiritual vocation. Just because you are comfortable with your routine, you wake up every morning, you make a nice breakfast parfait, you go hang out with the friends, you walk the dog, you sit and enjoy a book on the couch. It doesn't mean that when life flips on its head, you're going to still exude that goodness that was so easy when times were easy. Again, comfort doesn't equal safety. I found that when I'm my most confident, I make my biggest mistakes. <laughs> That's because I place my confidence in myself. Though it's so important to pray earnestly, that you may not place your confidence in yourself because it is not we that save ourselves, but we have to place our confidence in God. And through time and time again, when I pray that prayer, I can trust that he will come through because he came through before. And he's coming through in your life, and he has always been, and he will never fail you. Faith in God is believing that he will come through for you, even when you have no evidence that it will actually happen. And that faith takes trust, but we don't always trust because we are afraid. <laughs> and we're afraid because we don't have faith. I love the story of Peter 
Uh, and when the disciples went out into a boat, um, the water became uh, very uneasy. Uh, but Jesus came out there onto the water walking. And Peter in the boat saw Jesus on the water. And Jesus called out to Peter to come to him. And he did. Both the men were walking on water among the waves. But when Peter saw the waves, he became afraid and he sank. But Jesus came to him and he lifted him up out of the water and asked him, why do you have more faith in the waves than you have faith in me? When God calls for us, he is not just going to take us so far and then drop us. He's going to see us through to the end. And the reward for following Jesus no matter what is so great. Fear God because fear in him will destroy the confidence that the enemy has to rule over your life. In order to trust someone, you have to see how they came through before. That's why belief in God is a growing relationship because the longer you are with him, the more you will see him come through for you. And even if you have yet to realize how much God has been working in your life from day one, because I can say with certainty that he has, you have the infallible words of a God that reveals how he has worked in lives before. The word of God prevents us from forgetting how far he has led us, and it reveals how God can lead you. Don't for forget that you, <laughs> you can't get cleaned up and then come to God. It is the greatest lie that you could ever be told. You could tell yourself um, that you're not good enough to walk into a church. <laughs> that saying the name Jesus feels like it hits your chest and it just is too much. <laughs> but you won't get out of the hole that the devil has dug you in. And you won't be able to gain victory over the filth that you know is there until God helps you clean it. Every secret in our lives has an answer in Holy Scripture. If you are wondering that you've done some evil things and there is no point in trying to go back to God because you've already gone far enough, you can look at the story of David, of Saul, who later became Paul, Abraham, or the adulterous woman of Hosea 2, who after spurning every blessing she had ever been given to, um, is called back with these lovely words. And I'm going to read these because I love them. And I feel like that's how God calls us out of the things that we do. So Hosea 2, 14 to 32, it says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth and I will have mercy on her who hath not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. We are God's people. <laughs> and sometimes we make mistakes and it can feel like, God, I'm not measuring up to everything it means to be your people. But if you want to feel that you can truly be loved, look at the Song of Solomon and learn that the pursuit of the son of David or his bride will never end. If you know that you have to do what is right, but time and time again, you run from actually doing the right deed. You can look at the story of Jonah. If you want to know that God will have you in the great and the small, you have the life of Daniel. If you were ever called guilty when you, were, when you never were, you have the story of Joseph and of Jesus, a completely sinless man, sentenced to cruel and unusual capital punishment by the very people he loved the most. In the very life of Jesus, when he was being crucified, he called out to God asking him, why God did you forsake me? If you have ever felt completely abandoned by God, so has Jesus. But is it true that Jesus was abandoned by God? No. So when he thought he was the most alone, the Father was with him the most. Father, 
Why? When I look back on the footprints on the sand, why do I only see one set of footprints? Why was I alone? Father says, son, those, those were my footprints in the sand, and you only see mine because I was carrying you. With anything that you face, it is completely certain that you can find comfort in looking at the life of Christ, because I know he has comforted me. He is in heaven right now, and he is looking for every reason for you to be there with him, not every reason to keep you out of heaven. God is so real. And he is so real because I see what he does everywhere. I can say with certainty that he loves me like no one ever has. He has taught me what real unselfish love looks like because he has been nothing but patient and kind and giving, even though I know that I don't deserve anything he has given me. Out of all the things that God gives of us, we will never deserve it. So the fact that he loves us anyway and is always there to make the first move in repairing our relationship with him is astounding to me. Love God with all your heart, all of your soul, all your mind, and he will reward you greatly. Our nature will tell us to have the love of power. Your consciousness will do this whether you realize it or not. But what happens when you truly experience this loving God is that you will want to start being like him. You will no longer want to live for the love of power, but you will want to live for the power of love. Mm -hmm. In Western culture, we have a pretty distorted view of what love is. I saw a scene from a movie where an American man falls in love with a woman he met overseas. It was love at first sight, at least for him. And he tells this woman that he is madly in love with her, and she tells him that can't be. She says, love is more complicated here than it is in America. A direct arrow to the heart of Hollywood, which is where most base their distorted, self-elevating, self-sabotaging idea of what love really is. Love in the Bible is described as such. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. We've heard that verse a lot. <laughs> You're probably thinking, okay, I heard it a million times. But People wouldn't have to repeat that verse so many times if we just started living by it. I have learned here that there's no problem with reminders. God is love, and whoever abides in love will abide in God. So what happens when you have a society that's completely built on these principles of love, where people actually don't try to serve themselves, they don't try to preserve themselves, and they have true faith in God? I'm taking this excerpt from our book, Sonship of Christ, where in page 169, it talks about heaven. Um, it says that there is no self-serving hierarchy. There is no dominions, but only shared dominion through reciprocal service. Relationships will not be organized from the top down, but rather from the bottom up. The world where the top is on the bottom and those that are on the top are on the yeah, you know what? No one would care which is what. <laughs> a world in which everyone has forgotten about themselves while remembering everyone else instead. A world in which the king is girded with an apron, washing feet and serving food. A world in which the one who occupies the highest place actually prefers the lowest place. A world, in fact, in which all of this language of high and low up and down, top and bottom, which I was choking on earlier, is completely gone from consciousness and vocabulary, except from the ceaseless, voluntary exaltation flowing in praise from all rational creatures to the one and only true God, the final three who are in one in love. Yeah, God bless Ty Gibson, beautiful words. So, 
This is the culture of heaven, which flies in the face of everything we've ever known. Putting self aside, you will no longer want to put others down and put yourself on top. You will want to lift up all of humanity. And ironically enough, the jobs that produce the happiest employees are as follows. Chiropractic, dentist, conservation scientist, medical and health service manager, firefighter, human resources, manager, physician, nurse, physical therapist, teacher, psychologist, surgeon, and clergy those that work for God. God, in creating us in his image, made us to strive to be like him, to feel our happiness when we do the things that connect us with people and aiding the world to be a better place. God made us to feel our best when we're thinking about ourselves the least. So will you have more faith in yourself or faith in God? Dear yeah, Lord, thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you for these nine months and teaching me so much that I didn't know that I needed to know. And I pray that um, for those that are here, they may continue to exude your goodness even when we leave here and to continue growing in you because we've only scratched the surface. And in your name I pray. Amen.